Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We're going to get started. Um, just a little background before we get started, and we'll talk about what we're going to, what we're going to talk about. Um, there are two parts of this presentation. One has to do with logistics of going to Umrah, and the other has to do with Umrah itself. And that when I say Umrah itself, I mean the fiqh of Umrah and the spiritual aspects of Umrah. Uh, the people in the room and people in the virtual audience, there are going to be two types. There's a specific Umrah that there's a group called FIST that's going to be doing uh, on February uh, 11th. Inshallah, we leave. Um, so about 10% of this presentation is geared specifically towards that. Uh, but the rest of it is towards any Umrah, because umrah, an Umrah is an Umrah. Okay? So for those of you that are not going on February 11th, that's fine. There's a lot of stuff you will, inshallah, uh, gain from the presentation. Feel free to raise hands, ask questions. If we're going to, um, there may be portions we choose answer later on. We'll tell you that we're going to answer that later on. Okay. So uh, briefly, just a little question, a bit about FIST, F-I-S-T. This is a uh, foundation uh, for Islamic scholarship and teaching. And what we do at this foundation, we try to actually help scholars uh, in many different ways, whether it's publishing books or just helping them because they need some help on some financial things or in some programs or some any of the programs they have where they need some help. And then one of the things we decided to do also um, a couple of years ago, three years ago, was for the community offer Umrah programs for those people that really can't afford to go, but have been sort of heroes, sort of um, what I think of as um, heroes doing a lot of work behind the scenes, nobody knows about them. And they've been doing that for, you know, for years. Uh, to offer them a way to go to Umrah for, for no charge. And we collect money from the, from the community. And then along with that, other friends just come along and everything is at cost for those that either either you go relatively free or you go at cost if you are uh, just part of the community. And we'll be doing, this is our third Umrah, inshallah, that we'll be doing. So with that, uh, let me just get started. And there must be a way to change the slides. Okay, good. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. So I'm going to talk more about the logistics, and I will take maybe 15, 20 minutes. And then my son, Ibrahim, uh, who is a graduate, uh, both undergrad and, and grad of Zaytuna, will talk more, and has been to Umrah also many times, uh, will talk more specifically about uh, the fiqh of Umrah and the spiritual aspect of Umrah. So uh, with that, for those that are going whether you're going the first time, you're going the second time, third time, multiple times. There's several things that are just really, really super important, right? And that is, you are going to meet, you have to think about this, you're going to meet your Lord. Right? And I remember when I was young, and this applied to Hajj, applied to Umrah also, it's like, you are going and think of this as a dry run for the last day for Judgment Day, right? I remember when I was young, that's what I was told. Meaning, if you've done harm to anybody, ask them for your forgiveness before you leave. If you owe in debt to anybody, pay the debt off before you leave, right? And you're going, and you're going with the idea that you may not come back, right? So that's the, where your state of mind is, right? And that's how you have to think about this, right? So the intention of why you're going, this is not a shopping trip. This is not one of these, hey, I'm going to do this, this, that, that, that trip, right? You may do shopping. I'm not saying don't do shopping, but I'm saying there's a the sincerity of, I want to go to meet my Lord, right? That's, that's it. That's, that's the mindset you have, to go, you have to go with. And which means you have to clear your heart before you go of a lot of things that are dunya related, right? And one of the books I read frequently when I, before I go to Umrah is uh, the book about death by Ghazali. I forget which volume, is it the 40th volume? It's the last volume, right? The 40th volume. Um, and that just puts you in the right frame of it's not about dunya, it's not about dunya, it's about akhra, it's about akhra. Right, so read something to just get you in the right mind frame. 
Um, so intention, sincerity, adab. Um, adab here meaning just being courteous, adab here being being polite uh, to everybody, to the group that you're, with, you're in, or when you go to Umar, the people you're with, right? And if, you, if you're going to Umar the first time, it is going to, or, and you have not been outside the country, and you're not used to what a Middle Eastern country is like, or India is like, or Pakistan is like, and you're just not used to the crowds, the intensity of crowds, or Afghanistan, the intensity of crowds, you'll be overwhelmed just with the number of people. Right? And I remember one of my first, I don't remember, it's Omar al-Hajj, I'm coming out of uh, the masjid um, in Mecca, literally at the door, and we're walking like this, right? We're literally walking like this, because there's no space. And the guy sneezes, the guy behind me sneezes, and his stuff is, lands here. And you, you can't get mad. <laughs> I, mean, I wanted to, like, right? Or then you have to hold yourself back, right? Just expect all of that, and just roll with the punches. Just let it go. There are many, many people do, that do not. They don't. They get angry, and you see it. You just have to tell them, either ignore them or just tell them, the summer, summer, summer. Just tell them patience, patience, patience. Right? Because for many, for many, many people, they have never been on an escalator before. In the marshal, you're going to go up an escalator. The ladies or the men, they're afraid. They've never been on one. They've never been on a walk later. This is the first time they've been on a plane. And this is all new. Right? And some are literate and some are not literate. So remember, when you get there, it's people from all over the world. And they're going to have all sorts of reactions. And you have to be patient. You have to be patient throughout your trip. And grateful. I've been told many, many times, you get invited to go to Umrah. You may have your plan to go to Umrah, but you get invited. Right? So you have been invited. If you're going, you have been invited. Right? So think about that. Is it an invitation from Allah? Is it an invitation from our Prophet Sallallahu to come and do Umrah, to come visit his house, and come visit where Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is buried? And the last one, at least, I just said this earlier, is treat your group that you're with. This is your family. Yes, I know you got family back home. I got that completely. But this is your family. During this trip, this is your family. We're all brothers and sisters. We help each other whichever way we can. Okay? And go out of your way to help each other. Right? So that's the precursor, the prelim, if you will. The rest I'm going to go very quickly. It is more for the people that are going on this particular trip, uh, the 11th. Uh, I, there are 17 people from SFO that are going to be going on, on the trip. Uh, two from Memphis, three from Los Angeles, and four international. Yeah. The reason, by the way, is blue. I took the names out because this is going to be published. I didn't want the names out, you know, in everybody to see who's going who's not going to be at home at certain times, right? But it just tells you the number of people, the number of uh, females and males. Do you have a question, Kareem? So there's 17 people are going from SFO, nine males, eight females. And the three from Los Angeles will be joining you in Istanbul. Okay? Two from Memphis and then four international. That's, that's the group. And then a little more details. Um, the, I spent, I spelled pick up wrong. Um, a little more details. Just in the only thing important here is pick up. Uh, the 14 of you and the three, uh, three of you from LA and SFO will be picked up. Uh, you're all arriving at the same time, right? Exactly the same time because you have the same flight from Istanbul. You'll be picked up. Uh, my son and I will be the, at the airport picking you guys up uh, uh, by bus. Okay, so the rest of it from Medina onwards, don't worry, because we'll give you an update that, from that. Okay. There are folks that are coming, uh, just so you can see, myself and my son are going to be leaving early. We're going to Medina. So we look at the date. We're actually going February 7th, so we're leaving this Monday. Uh, and there's some folks from Memphis who are coming a little bit later. And then Irfan, who's in the back over there, uh, you're coming from uh, Esavodah by Jeddah, and you'll be coming a little bit later also. 
If I don't talk to you offline, it may make sense for you and the person of Memphis to go together because you're within 45 minutes. Okay, then, and then, because we're going from London and people are going from Jeddah, uh, from Amman. Okay, pre flight. It doesn't matter whether you're with this group or another group, there are a whole bunch of things you got to do pre flight that are important, whichever group you're with. Okay, first, have a visa. A visa, as you know, you can get a Saudi visit. Dot com, I think, and you can get it. takes about 10 minutes to get a visa. You need your passport. Passport has to be good for six months after you leave. So, the passport has to be good. So, if you're leaving in February, the passport has to be good for another six months, otherwise, you won't get the visa. Right? Everybody in our group has already gotten a visa. Um, visas online, I think it's about 130 bucks or something like that. Uh, along with when you pay for the visa, you also pay for insurance. And this is insurance in Saudi. So if you get sick, you are covered while you're in Saudi. Okay. Um, now notice when you get the visa, there's usually two documents. Most of you have the visa doc. Many of you probably don't have the insurance doc. If you go back in and log back in, you can actually print the insurance doc. Okay. What is important for you, that insurance doc actually is not that important. What is important for you particularly in Turkish Airlines, it depends which airline, they want to see that you have insurance. I just showed my Kaiser insurance and they didn't care, right? But they want to know you have insurance and they, otherwise they will not let you on the flight, okay? So bring either your insurance card, and if you don't have insurance, then you actually got insurance when you got your visa. You just have to pull those pages down, okay? And if you have any trouble with that, just call me. We'll be able to get that uh, get through. Um, as of I think a year ago, no shots are required, no COVID shots, right? You may want to get them, not get them. That's completely up to you. Nobody's going to ask for them. Okay. If you're going for Hajj, uh, you will be required to take meningitis shots, and is recommended by the CDC and by I forget the other group to take meningitis shots. I don't take them. I only take him for Hajj. Uh, so completely up to you. If you take him, you're going to get sick. You should take a week before. They're expensive. Sometimes they're covered by insurance. Sometimes they're not. I just don't take him. I haven't taken them. And I go frequently. I haven't taken them in, in years. OK, pre-flight. If you're going to Jeddah first, if you're going to Mecca first, you are going to be in Ahram. OK? Uh, you can wear Ahram before you leave at San Francisco recommend you don't do that. And for men, ahram, by ahram, my son will go over this. There's ahram clothing and there's also a state of ahram. I'm talking about ahram clothing. Okay. So you can wear your ahram clothing when you're in a San Francisco airport or, when, or before you leave. Better not to. When you get to Istanbul, we'll talk about that here in a second, then you can um, wear your ahram clothing. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a second. So, since we're going to Mecca, this group is going to Mecca first. Recommendation, of course, is take a shower here before you get on the plane. Cut your hair, uh, as you're supposed to. That includes armpits and pubic hair. Cut your hair. When I say cut your hair, I'm talking about shave your hair here and here. Uh, cut your nails is what I meant to say. Um, and um, if somebody could... Open that. I think somebody's trying to get, get, get in. And that's the pre-flight. So now you're flying, you're flying from here to, in this case, Istanbul or Qatar or wherever you're going, right? You have about, in this case, you have two hours in Istanbul. In some cases, you may have three, you may have four, whatever it is. It's not a lot of time, especially for men, right? So now you're in Istanbul. Okay, my recommendation is go straight to the Jeddah gate. Right, there's 17 of you, get together, go straight to the Jeddah gate. Figure out what gate Jeddah is going to be, go to that gate. When you're there, when you arrive there, then you go to the bathrooms, you do wudu, you do your makeup prayers, the prayers you did not do because you missed them or you didn't do during the flight. Do all your makeup prayers there and then uh, wear your ahram. Okay, I meant to bring one and I actually put it in the wrong car. 
Um, ihram is very, very simple to put on. Uh, I don't have a piece of clothing. Um, but you basically put it around your waist, right? And there's a white belt you can get, and I recommend you getting a white belt. You can get any belt you want to. But once you, uh, once you get the belt, oh, let me just come on this side. Once you get the belt, uh, remember, you have a towel that's wrapped around you, right? And put the belt about four inches below the top of the towel. And then wrap the towel over the belt, all around. Right, all around. That's it. That thing is not coming off. You may feel uncomfortable, and you may put your hand here just in case, but it's not coming off. Right, and you'll get used to it. You'll get used to it very, very, very quickly. Okay. Now you are in Ehram. My son will talk about this. Me, uh, for ladies and men, you have to pray two prayers. I think it's Nafal, right? It's recommended. But you pray two prayers, Nafal, or rec recommended. Uh, Sunnah Recommended. Recommended, okay. So you pray uh, two Nafal. And somewhere between there and the Mikat, which is the line that defines uh, where you have to be in a state of haram, you do your intention. Okay. The, the important thing I want to state is the following. Once you're in ihram, you have to complete your umrah before you can get out of ihram. So if that plane does not take off, and the next plane is five hours later, or ten hours later, you have to stay in that state of ihram which means you don't cut your nails, you don't pull your hair, you don't wash with soap, you don't put fragrance, it means all those things, okay? So my recommendation, we'll talk about this again, my recommendation is don't actually make the niya of ihram until your plane takes off, right? Because we have known people that have been stuck in ihram for days because they couldn't get on the next flight, right? And they're in a state of ihram, you stay in a state of ihram, okay? We'll talk more about that. I'm sure my son, will, Ibrahim, will talk more about this later. What do you take with you? Whatever regular medicines. If you're a diabetic, if you have, you know, heart problems, whatever your normal set of medicines are, make sure you take them with you. Uh, take Tylenol, take Advil, take something else for pain, take something for coughs. Uh, if you have an antibiotic, you can take an antibiotic. All these things are available there. Right? By Annabelle, it used to be you can get anything over the counter. Now you need prescriptions for, for most things over there, which means you have to go to the doctor. Right? Uh, but med all the medicines are available there, but I would take a little bit of what you normally take. And if you can take an antibiotic with you, it's probably better. Uh, almost everybody will get a cough. I almost guarantee that, whether it's there or when you come back. Right, uh, there's a little bit of lingering effect you have. Um, so that's in medicines. Your ahram for men, your ahram belt in your carry-on luggage. Right, don't make the mistake of putting in your checked-in baggage because then you, you when you land, you're not a haram. And he can tell you what the implications of that are. Okay, questions on that? Just in terms of prep. Okay, how many luggage pieces to take? My recommendation is take as little as you can. So that means one check-in luggage, um, and then take a, um, uh, so one luggage for underneath. One check-in, I'm sorry, one check-in luggage and one uh, a cabin luggage. That's it. Don't take a second one. The reason I say don't take a second one is, for many people, they take the train between Mecca and Medina, right? And there they usually just allow one hand carry luggage. Last time I went, we took the other luggage too, and there was no problem, right? But just try to bring as little luggage as possible. What you need, you can get there. And there are laundry shops available cheaper than here. Right, so if you need, you know, clothes washed, you can get them washed. 
I wouldn't get them washed at the, ho at the hotels. Those are very expensive. Uh, but I know places where you can get them washed. Next day you get them, or go in the morning, it's, it's available that night. Okay? Any, clo any questions on clothing or any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah. I'll let uh, Ibrahim answer that a little later. So, yeah, right. so the, the day of Ihram ends when you cut your hair. So normally the entire Umrah takes maybe four or five hours at maximum. Three, three. I think it'll take three. Three, three hours. With this group, it'll take three. So you'll be in Ihram basically from Istanbul to the time you complete your Umrah, which is maybe three hours after you begin uh, the Umrah in Mecca. Yeah. Omar is just Mecca. Right? You, you basically do a tawaf, you do sa'i, uh, and you, you pray in between, you do the sa'i. Uh, when you do the sa'i, Umrah is almost over. Then uh, we'll get the haircut uh, or shaved, whichever. Uh, then you're, you're, you're out of the state. Okay? For women, uh, for men it's very easy. You, you get your, when you're done, right, you go to a barber shop and you get your haircut. Either an inch off or all of it off, right? And I recommend you get all of it off. You're fine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, good friend. Take it all off. Take your hair off. Uh, for ladies, it's more difficult because you cannot cut your own hair in a state of ihram. You can't cut your friend's hair in a state of ihram, right? So you've got to find somebody to cut your hair that is not in a state of ihram. And once, once that person does it, they, then you can cut each other's hair an inch, right, all, all, all around, right? So we basically, at the hotel, when we get back, and the ladies get back, we'll find somebody who's not in the state of Ahram, they'll cut an inch, right? And it could be a guy or a gal, but hopefully it'll be a gal. They'll cut an inch, and then that person cuts somebody else's hair, that person cuts somebody else's hair, that person cuts somebody else's hair, okay? It's a little tricky, but just remember that. I'm not worried about that because we're, 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 we're going to be there, so we'll tell you the rules as we go through, right? So we'll tell you what you could do and not do. Yeah. So the ihram for men, for ladies, is anything you want, any, anything goes. Uh, for men, it is two pieces of clothing, okay? Um, and you can put the belt, okay? The clothing should be unstitched, okay? So that's, that's towels. Um, and um, yeah, and you can have a pouch. And frankly, you're going to have these. I don't. Unfortunately, I didn't bring it. I don't even know how to describe it. How would you describe it? The the, the pack. Um, um, like a like a gym bag you can have with with shoulder straps. Yeah, gym bag. Because you know you're going to have your shoes with you, or your your flip flops with you, and you're going to take them off because you're going to walk around. You don't, you don't walk with the shoes on, right? You take them off. In the old days, they had, sh they had sh uh, shoe, shoe racks everywhere. You just put the shoe racks, and half the time, your shoes get, you lose them anyway. Um, but now there are few shoe racks. Everybody just carries them. They put their phone in their little pack. Uh, they put uh, their ID in the pack. I wouldn't put any money in the pack. I would make sure you have an ID in case something happens to you. We don't know who you are. I would put down your hotel, which you're in, so people know if something happens to you, where to go, you know, where, where you are, uh, and your phone and what you're, 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 what you're wearing. Your own back. Everybody brings their own. Yeah. And not the big heavy backpack, the light, the, you know, the thing with the two strings, gym back, a very light gym back. Right. So any questions on that? Okay. Um, I'm going to go quickly. Two things that are critical on the right-hand side. Phones. Everybody should have a smartphone. Why? Because there are two places where you need phone. In the hotel, you have internet connection. Okay. But I'm talking about cell coverage. You need cell coverage when you're outside of the hotel. And where you need it is two places. You need it to do the appointment for the Roda. Roda is literally where Hazrat is buried. We're going to go close to that. That is by appointment only. It is very, very hard to get in. 
I mean, there's a good chance half of us will not be able to get in, and most of the women will not be able to get in. And I don't say that, I'm just saying that because I know people who just came back from trips literally last week and were not able to get in. Uh, it used to be you could go there, you could go to Rwanda once every 30 days. Now, it's, now you can only go there once every 365 days, once a year. Okay. So, which means uh, you have to get an appointment. So get the Nusuk application, N U S U K. Get it, you put the passport in, and then see if you can make an appointment for the days while we're there. It doesn't matter what time, my recommendation, do it at nighttime, do it after Isha. But whatever time you can get in, get in. This we're not going to do as a group, because chances of getting 17 people or 23 people at one time are like next to zero. Right, so we're going to do this individually. Okay, and I think about a week before you go, they open it up. They allow you to take appointments. Sometimes they say it'll fall. You try the next day. It's full. You try it the next day. You try it five times during the day. I've actually tried it twenty times during the day, just just to get in, and boom, it pops up, and then it's closed. Okay. So you get your appointment. Okay. The when you get your appointment, you will see a live app that is running on here, right, and it's blinking, right, and they take an, R, they, take an uh, they both use RFID, but, but my point is they want to see a live app. It's not going to be live unless you have cell coverage, but it just won't be live when you have cell coverage. Oh, thank you. Okay, thanks. But I went too far. So, uh, your options are, you call your carrier. I have T-Mobile, Saudi Arabia is free. It doesn't matter if you're in Saudi or not, you get cell coverage for free in Saudi Arabia with T-Mobile. Uh, if you have Verizon or any of the other guys, I think it's about $40 a month for Saudi coverage, or maybe $100 a month. It's been a while since I've used it. The third option is just buy a SIM card. A SIM card is about $25. You only need it for, sh don't use it all the time. You only need it for those periods of time when you are actually literally outside the hotel. That's the only time you need the SIM card. And you only need it for getting in the Rhoda, and you, you don't, I, I, here it says you need it uh, for um, Umrah appointment, there are Umrah appointments, but I don't know anybody who's been there in the past year that's actually, I mean, I get the appointment, nobody ever checks. They don't check, you just go, right? Um, and it's easier for ladies to, to do Umrah uh, because for men, they actually look to see if you're wearing your ahram or not. If you're wearing your ahram, they let you enter on the tawaf, the main floor. If you're a lady, they let you enter on the main floor no matter what, right? But that's the way of filtering out, reducing the number of people on the mataf, which is the first floor. Otherwise, if you're just doing tawaf, uh, or just, they'll send you to the second floor. And the th third floor is closed, which means it's packed, right? Uh, the, other, the other application I would download is Hislo, H-I-S-L-O. Uh, this is just historical sites uh, that uh, uh, one of the scholars put together of Mecca and Medina. And it's not just Mecca and Medina, it's all historical sites in Saudi Arabia. Okay, I need to speed up a little bit. Um, any questions? Okay. So the critical things here are ihram, right? When you land in Istanbul and you gotta like almost run to the gate to Jeddah, you gotta do vadu, you gotta make up your prayers, you gotta do your nafal for for ihram, for the ihram, for the for the umrah, and then as soon as you get on the plane, make make your intention. Okay. And before you get there, make sure you get Nusuk and try to get your appointment for Umrah. I'm going to start tomorrow because we're leaving a bit earlier. 
I'm going to start tomorrow, and then we'll give you updates on who's gotten it. It's, it's tricky. There's some things over there that are tricky, so just feel free to, this group, feel free to call each other for help. Any questions? Well, it depends which appointment you're talking about. So Umrah, appointment about a week before you leave. I'm not hung up on the Umrah, whether you get that or not, because it's never been a problem. Okay? But still try to get it, right, just in case. Uh, the Medina one is more important. I don't exactly know when they open up. I would just start looking. Right? Well, that's next. Perfect. Okay, Mecca, February 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16th, we leave. Okay, uh, I'm not going to go up through this because I think my, my son is going to cover uh, most of this. Uh, but there, you're going to get lots of books of du'as. That's fine, you can read those. But du'as from the heart, so see du'as. Don't feel hurry, don't feel rushed. Everything around you is going to be rushed. You don't want to be in that mode, right? Let the rush be out there. You're calm. You're tranquil. You're just sakina, in a state of sakina, right? Um, occupy yourself with the Quran. Uh, as my son will probably tell you, rather than doing nafal, it is recommended you do tawaf. Seven circuits, right? So uh, instead of doing nafal prayers, there, better to tawaf. Better to tawaf. Okay. Um, I think that's it on this side. Uh, the right hand side, I'll, I'll send this to all of you on the team here so you know. Uh, but basically, most of us are landing on the 11th at 7, p uh, at 7 p.m. That night, probably around noon, I'm sorry, around midnight, we will do Umrah. Because you're going to land at 7. You're going to, by the time we get to the hotel, be probably 8.30. Relax. If you want to take a shower, take a shower. Do not, you're in the city of Ahram. Do not use the soap in the, in, the, in the bathrooms. Do not use the shampoo in the bathrooms. Don't use soap. Don't use shampoo. Just take a shower. If you need to take a shower, take a shower with water, and that's it. Yes, you can get perfumeless soap, but I never feel comfortable knowing it is really perfumeless soap, right? So just... You know, water only. You go to the bathroom, water only. Don't use the soap. Right? Around probably midnight, we will all go. All of us. The three or four people will, will not have arrived. Uh, we'll talk about what to do there uh, outside of this. And then we'll all go for Umrah. Umrah will take about three hours. The whole thing. Right? Then we'll come back to the hotel, get our hair cut, and we'll be starved and we'll eat. Right, because there are places to eat 24 hours. We'll eat. Um, so that's the first day. Uh, we are staying the Swiss Mecca Hotel. It's right across, uh, it's right across the masjid. Literally right across the masjid, right? No, no, even though it's right across the masjid, it takes a good 20 minutes to just get out of the hotel, wait for the elevators, cross the boundary, get to the masjid, and then from the masjid, find a place where you're going to sit. That will take at least half an hour. On Friday, Juma, you want to leave at least, if Juma is at, I'm going to pretend, I don't know exact time, let's pretend uh, Juma is at 12.15, you want to be there in the masjid at 10.15. Even though it's that close. Because they start locking with uh, gates, pla these plastic gates, whatever they're called, they start locking areas and they block it. You cannot come from here, you have to now walk around. You cannot go from here, you have to walk around. This door is closed, this door is closed, this one's open. But to get to this door, you've got to go this. Right, that happens a little bit after 10 o'clock. So if you want to get in and not be in the sun during, during the khutbah, then you want to leave 10 o'clock, right? Um, so very quickly, we'll do a ziyara. That could, uh, ziyara is a visit to the historical sites, likely on the 14th from 8 to Zohar. There'll be a class. I'm going to ask Imam Hamza Malik to do almost every night, not the first night. But this we'll talk about when we get there. I don't think we need to go through all. You'll get copies of this. We'll, get, we'll take you through this. The important thing is the last day. Juma. We're leaving after Juma. 
checkout time is 12 o'clock. Jemima is at one something. So you will have all your luggage outside ready to go at about 10 o'clock. Because remember, I told you, you have to leave at 10. Luggage ready to go at 10. We go to the mothership, do Jemima, come out. By the time we land back, it's probably going to be like 1.30 or 2. Then we're going to take a bus to the train. So the bus will leave at 3, get there at 4. We're going to take the 5 o'clock train. We're going to arrive in Medina two hours later, and we'll, we'll, miss, uh, we'll miss Isha. Uh, but we'll have our first night in Medina. Okay. Uh, Medina, I'm going to skip, because we could, we could talk about this when we get, to, when we get there, right? Uh, I think that's it. So that is just logistics, things to remember and not to forget. And Ibrahim, you want this down here? so today obviously we'll be talking about um, Umrah. Umrah, uh, as, as I'm sure most of you know, each of the pillars of Islam are, it's obligatory, but each one has an associated recommended act with it. And so the, and, and so for example, with the, with the testimony of faith, the recommended act that, that's associated with it is sending salawat on the Prophet wasallam. With your or obligatory prayers, there are recommended uh, prayers. With zakat, there's recommended sadaqa, etc. So the recommended act that pairs with hajj is umrah, and that's why it's called the minor pilgrimage. When Allah um, obligated hajj on us, he revealed the ayah that today I perfected for you your religion and completed my favor upon you and I am pleased that Islam be your religion. In other words, Hajj is considered the, is considered the final ibadah. It's the final thing that you do in your life. It's the thing that you do right before you die. And in many ways, the, both the Umrah and, and the Hajj specifically are uh, preparations for death. And so there is a, and so when someone goes uh, to Umrah, when someone goes to Tumuk and Medina, there's a stripping off of all your property, there's a stripping off all, of all your clothes, and you, um, uh, and you look the same as everyone else. Because when we're resurrected on, on Yom Al-Qiyamah, we'll be resurrected without any clothes on. But we'll be so frightened on that day that we won't you know, be looking at each other on that day. But everyone will, will be the same. There will be no material differences or variances between people. Um, and additionally, the, um, we'll see this as we go through. Um, what you're doing in, in the Hajj is reorienting yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and obviously the same in the Umrah. When you're making tawaf, you're circling around the Kaaba. And we know that the Kaaba physically is just stones. But at the same time, somebody who worships the stones has actually left Islam. We don't worship stones. We worship Allah. And, this, and the stones is just the place that Allah has set as, as a representative of him. And so outwardly, externally, the Kaaba is just stones. But internally, its internal reality is as the house of Allah. Again, this reflects the state of the heart and what the human being should be doing in all of life. Um, we begin whenever we recite the Quran or, or, or almost anything with um, the dua, A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Rajim. I seek shelter in Allah uh, from the accursed shaitan. <clears throat> what does that literally mean? To seek shelter means that you're, you've compared Allah to a house. That house is what protects you and Allah is what protects you. In other words, the Kaaba is the house of Allah and your heart should be a house of Allah as well. Just as Allah protects you, just Allah protects people in, in the Kaaba and uh, it's a sacred area and there are, and to commit a sin in, in, 
in Mecca and Ur Medina is much more grievous, a thousand times more grievous than, than committing a sin elsewhere. Similarly, Allah protects your heart. The ideal person is someone who makes uh, his heart the Kaaba, as it were. So let's begin uh, by going over some of the fiqh. So the, so the Ummah has four requirements uh, to, to, to fulfill. Um, if, you have all, if, if you do all of these, you've completed the, the Umrah. If not, then either you need to repeat your Umrah or you need to pay some sort of penalty, which we'll go over. The first one is Ihram, second one is Tawaf, third is Sa'i. So Sa'i is, is running between Safa and Marwa. And the fourth is the haircut. So to begin, uh, Ihram has several components, the first of which is the garment. Now, before, before we put on the garment, you know, we'll, we'll do that in, in Istanbul, inshallah. The preparation for Umrah begins before Istanbul. It begins when you leave here, when, when you leave your home. Um, whenever, you know, because the meaning of Umrah is to go and to get ready to, to meet your Lord as though you're dying, you should say farewell to everyone here. I think as, as my dad was saying, if there's anyone who um, you need to seek forgiveness from, if there's any debts you need to uh, repay, all of those should be done as much as possible before you leave. And so you should prepare and um, make dua and, and ready yourself uh, to, to meet your Lord. Uh, practically what this also entails is, you know, if you're coming straight out of work, and then getting on a flight, and then uh, you're going to be in, in Istanbul in 36 hours. You're, that's not enough time to get out of like the the working busyness m mindset into the mindset of service and being humble before Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. So I, I'd highly recommend before you leave, spending half a day, one day, just clearing your mind, clearing your your sort of not not doing anything, and just preparing your heart. Um, being in a state of ibadah, reading something about, about the Hajj or the Umrah, or um, reminding yourself in various ways, uh, reading some of the du'a books that we'll mention. Um, that way, when you reach uh, Umrah, your heart will be ready for it. You won't, your mind won't be distracted with other things. Um, before you leave, you should read two, two rakas. This is just recommended, not, not, not required. And then when you land in Istanbul, obviously you'll need to leave, leave the plane. Uh, and then when you get to the Jeddah gate, you should go to, uh, this is for men, you should go to, to the restroom, change into what are essentially towels. And then you can make your intention and so on and so forth. The rules for, for the garment are as follows. You cannot wear anything stitched or sewn. Anything stitched or sewn that covers a limb. So the exception here are belts. You can wear stitched belts because stitched belts don't cover a limb. They just, you know, hold your, uh, um, you know, hold your um, your lower garment together. Um, the stitches, the reason stitches and sewing are not allowed is stitches represent something, which is your attachment to this world. Remember when when you're going to Umrah, you're stripping off everything of the world. You're stripping off your clothes even. And so you can't wear anything that's tying you to, to this world. You're getting ready to go to the Akhirah, getting ready to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want any attachments left. And so the stitches likewise have to go. They're symbolic of letting go of the dunya. Um, you can wear a belt. Uh, if you buy one of those ihram packages, they'll often come with a belt. Or you can just wear your normal belt uh, if you prefer that. Uh, you can wear sandals and, and flip-flops where the top is exposed. Meaning that, uh, imagine if this is your foot. You can't have something that's going to cover most of the bone of the foot here. What you need is, is, is the type of flip-flop where you have one, one thing that comes up and turns into two prongs. That's sort of a, a flip-flop. So like the, if any of you have seen like the thick Adidas slippers, those don't work. But other flip-flops will work. And you can, and actually should, uh, wear a small traveling pouch around your waist, and that will carry your um, your phone and, and your wallet and whatever else, whatever other necessities. Um, for women, 
you can wear any type type of, of clothing. However, because of the spirit of of the Umrah, it, it's recommended that you wear something plain, uh, and uh, that it's it's mostly white or mostly black. Um, uh, women can't wear a niqab, and that includes a mask, uh, and that also goes goes for men. You can't wear anything covering your face, mask or or anything else. Um, both men and women should not wear uh, gloves, although there's one school that allows it, so it's not entirely prohibited. And, and, and similarly, women like men can wear uh, pouches to carry their things. Any, any questions on this, on the garments? Yeah. Yeah, uh, gla uh, glasses are fine, contacts are fine. Um, you can't cover your head, though. Uh, so anything that would cover, you know, any, any sort of head covering, any sort of hat, any sort of kufi, wouldn't be allowed. But yeah, glasses, eye contacts are fine. Bismillah. So once you put on the ihram garments, uh, then you need to uh, make your intention for entering into the state of ihram. Now, what do we mean by by the state of, of ihram? All of you know that when you begin your prayers, you begin with a takbir, right? You begin with saying Allahu Akbar. That takbir is called takbir al ihram. That's called takbir al ihram. It's the Allahu Akbar, you say, to enter into a sacred state. Ihram means to make sacred. So you enter into a sacred state. When you're making the intention of ihram, what you're saying is, I resolve to begin my umrah and, to resolve, and I resolve to enter into the sacred state with Allah. That sacred state is the state of being a faqir, someone who's needy, someone who's a beggar, someone who's in utter humility before Allah. And that's why I will we'll talk about it more, but a person should always be in the state of talbiyah, always telling Allah, Ya Allah, I'm at your service right now. Oh Allah, I'm here for you oh, right now. I acknowledge your lordship as you are, um, as is uh, worthy of you. And so the intention it doesn't need to be verbalized. The intention is just resolve in the heart. If you want to verbalize it, you can say something along the lines of, Oh Allah, I intend Umrah, so facilitate it for me and accept it from me. You are the all-hearing and the all-knowing. Um, once you make this, this intention, then you need to say the talbiyah at least once, but the sunnah is to do it three times. And that's, Labbaik Allahumma labbaik, la sharika laka labbaik, inna alhamda wa ni'amata laka wal mulk, la sharika lak. At your service, Allah, at your service. At your service, you have no partner. At, at your service, all praise and blessings belong to you as this dominion. You have no partner. And so you repeat this three times. And then afterwards, you, um, between uh, you entering into the state of Ihram and entering into the Masjid, a person should always be repeating the Talbiyah. Constantly, you you can you can obviously stop to, to make du'as, or if you need to uh, say some you know just say some things to to your neighbor or something that's fine, but the idea is you're in a state of sacredness before Allah. You're in a state of humility and worship before Allah, and you should always be trying to be in a state of dhikr and in a state of remembrance of Allah, invoking Allah, and specifically with this talbiyah. And then after you make your your talbiyah, then you've entered the state of ihram. And as we'll get to, there's certain things that are prohibited when, when you're in a state of ihram. And that's when those prohibitions begin, once you've said your talbiyah. And then it's recommended to send prayers, salawat on the Prophet ﷺ, and to make dua for yourself and for others as well. Oh, sorry, there was one more thing I meant to mention. Before the intention, before you get onto the flight, the, um, it's recommended to pray two, uh, two rakahs of a prayer. This isn't required. This isn't required. It's just nafil. Uh, in the first one, to recite Surah Al-Ikhlas, Allahu Ahad. And in the second one, to, or, sorry, in the first one, to recite Surah Al-Kafirun, Qul Ya Ayyuhal Kafirun. And in the second one, to recite uh, Surah Al-Ikhlas, Qul Allahu Ahad. So um, you put on your, uh, the ihram garment, uh, pray the, the two recommended rakahs, make your intention, and then talbiyah, and then you've entered into the state of ihram. Now, what do we mean by ihram? What do we mean by the sacred state? When someone enters into ihram, you're in a state where 
you're going before Allah as if you were dead, as if you had been, as if you've died and been resurrected. In other words, there's no grooming in this um, uh, at this point. You're before Allah. There's no lewd speech. There's no argumentation. Um, sp specifically, as well, uh, hunting and, and, and marital and intimacy are both pr prohibited. So grooming, what do we mean? Uh, you can't trim, trim your nails. You can't remove hair from any part of the body. Uh, even if that's like rubbing your head and, and hair falls down, you should um, refrain from that as much as possible. You can't apply oil to, to your hair. Uh, you can't touch perfume. And that's why of uh, the warnings against touching soap or touching um, shampoo because that will put, they'll get, get perfume, perfume on you. Uh, it's prohibited to touch perfume with your clothes or with your body. Another thing to understand is once you're at, once you're at the Kaaba, oftentimes the kiswa of the Kaaba will have perfume on it as well. So when you're doing Umrah, if you have the chance to, to go all the way up, up, to the, up to the Kaaba, there might be perfume on the kiswa, so don't actually touch it. Uh, maintain some distance from it. So all of these things have to do with grooming. A person is not allowed to do these things. Additionally, like I mentioned, hunting, marital in, in, intimacy, and just general argumentation are all prohibited in this state. Um, argumentation is always prohibited, but it's a especially severe uh, sin at this time in, in this state. What can you do? Uh, you can take a bath and take a shower, or you can scratch an itch as long as you're careful that no hair falls out, and you can wear a ring or a watch, even though this isn't recommended. It just wouldn't... Um, uh, it wouldn't uh, result in a penalty. If you do anything on the left-hand side, that will require some sort of penalty to be paid. I, I don't have all that listed because the details can be quite quite lengthy. But if it happens, let me know, and I will figure out how much that that exactly is. It usually isn't too much money. Yeah. So 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 if you do. It, it, yeah, sorry. So if you do accidentally end up trimming your nails or some hair falls out or something like that, then there's a penalty to be paid for that. Yeah, so when you, uh, uh, once, uh, once you arrive in Jeddah and you're checked into your, your hotel, there might be time to take a very quick shower or, or to change or to wash up or something. Yeah, and then we'll um, uh, go to the haram to begin the umrah. Yeah, so when... After you leave, so after your hair is cut, then you'll leave the state of, the state of Ahram. You can continue to, to enter into the haram, do tawaf, do, you wouldn't be, do, be doing sa'i. But at that point, you don't need to be in, in the towels anymore. And so there's no restrictions on you in terms of the things we just mentioned. Um, ihram, when do we put it on? Now, you'll notice here on the right-hand side, you see essentially an area laid out with boundaries. These boundaries are called the miqat. And so the Prophet ﷺ told us that anyone who passes these boundaries intending to do Umrah or Hajj must enter into a state of Ihram before crossing the boundary. This is for someone who's coming from outside of Mecca, as we will be, because we'll be coming from Istanbul. What that means is when the plane's flying in, at some point it's going to cross one of these, these boundaries. At that point, you have to be in a state of Ihram. But you won't know exactly when that is. You won't know exactly when that is. So, what does that mean? You should put on, a, 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 basically, you should put on your garment and pray in Istanbul before you leave, oh, for sure. In terms of making your intention and reciting the talbiya, I would personally recommend doing it right when you board. Just so that if you want to sleep on the flight, if you forget, you're already in a state of ihram. However, you can wait, and about 45 minutes before the plane reaches uh, Jeddah, you'll be crossing the border. So here I've written down one hour. Ar around one hour before arriving, then you can make your intention and do your talbiyah. And uh, so that should be fairly sh straightforward. If you're now, after we do our umrah, you can choose to do a second umrah if, or a third umrah if you like. To do so, you need to enter back into a state of, of ihram. What does that mean? You need to go, go out to a miqat boundary. Then you need to come into a state of ihram, wear, wear the garments, make your intention, do your talbiyah, and then come back. 
the miqat boundary for Mecca, if you start within Mecca, is Masjid Aisha. And so if you want to go, every taxi driver, every bus driver will, 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 will know what, what, what Masjid Aisha means. You get in, into a taxi, it'll be about a 20-minute drive to, to Masjid Aisha. There you make your intention, say your talbiyah, and come back. And now, now you're in a state, a state of ihram again, and you have to complete um, the, uh, the Umrah rituals before you exit the state of ihram. Uh, no. uh, any questions on Ihram before we move on? Yeah, I got it. Question, uh, in that state, let's just say we did want to do it again. Do uh, you think by that time we would be uh, well informed enough to do it by ourselves? Yeah, 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 I think so. They, um, it, it usually doesn't take too long to figure out where things are. And it, 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 once you've done it once, it's pretty straightforward to know what you're doing. Yeah, go ahead. So for your second, you, you don't have to You So you just go back to, to, to the barber. They'll just do, do a one over and take off whatever bits you might have, and that's it. They have clippers, they have clippers and they have blades uh, for shaving. No, uh, go ahead. Sorry, the Umrah? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other? Yeah. Yeah, so your intention in your Umrah, uh, your first Umrah should be done uh, with, um, for, for yourself. Um, I won't get into the fact of it, but but you should do it, intending it to be for yourself. Afterwards, you, you can do intention and combine multiple well, intentions together. So you can do it on behalf of 10 different people all at the same time. And now, Ahram, going once, going twice. Let's go. Okay. So uh, um, when you enter into the Kaaba, um, there's some landmarks you should recognize. The first one is going to be the black stone. Um, you won't see the black stone. There will be a huge crowd around it, unless it's prayer time, in which case, as you can see here, um, they'll have blocked off the, uh, the area, and you'll probably see uh, some guards uh, standing by it. After the black stone is the Hijra Ismail. So if you look on the left-hand side, on the left-hand side of the Kaaba here, that's where the black stone would be on that corner. You go around one corner, you're at the Hijra Ismail, which is also known as the Hatim. The Hijra Ismail is important because this originally used to be a part of the Kaaba, and there's some disagreement on whether it's the entire space or just the, the space marked here. But in any case, this was the original part of the Kaaba. When the Kaaba was destroyed and rebuilt, the Kaaba was made smaller. And so praying in this area is a really special place in, in the world to pray because you're praying within the Kaaba, you're praying within the original Kaaba. And this is a place where your dua is accepted, your dua is mustajab. So it can be quite hard to get in here. There's a lot of uh, traffic and crowds, obviously. Um, that's the significance of that place. And then the other place to know is the Yemeni corner. The Yemeni corner is right before the black stone. So here, where it says Rukan Aswad, that's the black stone. Rukan Iraqi is where the Hijra Ismail begins. So before you, if you're going, uh, if you're going counterclockwise, then the one before the black stone is the Yemeni corner. And the Yemeni corner is a, is a place that, that, you, um, that when you're doing thawaf, you, um, you make special uh, dua at, uh, specifically because it's associated with the angels and the acceptance of, uh, of dua. And then lastly, the, the last place to know is the Maqam Ibrahim. The Maqam Ibrahim is that gold structure. Inside of it, if you're, if you're able to look, is a footprint of, of Sayyidina Ibrahim salam, and it's protected by this, uh, this glass casing. This is next to the black stone, so the, the left side of the Kaaba right now is the black stone. If you come out, and on the right-hand side is the Hijra Ismail, and the Maqam Ibrahim is over here. So this will help, help you get your bearings for, um, for where you are around the Kaaba. You begin your tawaf and end your tawaf at the black stone. 
and, and there'll be a, a green light on the opposite side, um, uh, uh, on the mushed side, which will tell you that this is the place that you begin your, your, your toaf and end your, your toaf. So you'll start there and start going around. Um, so the Kaaba obviously is a place of um, many secrets and a greatly honored place. The first sighting of, of the Kaaba is especially uh, something sacred and something that, that stays with you um, for the entirety of your life. And so from the time that you enter into uh, the state of, of Ahram to the time that you um, uh, begin the Kaaba, there, or the time you see the Kaaba, there are several things that a person should do. For, first of all, obviously be conscious and mindful of Allah in every moment and every act because it's a particularly sacred state. To constantly chant the Talbiyah, again, you don't need to be shouting at just at a medium pitch, is fine. When you enter Mecca, there's a dua you should make, that you're entering the Haram. The Haram is a sacred place, it's a, it's a place that things are forbidden. And so there's a dua that you should make here, that you yourself are made forbidden from the fire, just as you're entering into a forbidden place, into a sacred place. Then when you enter the masjid itself, once you're into Mecca uh, and then into the masjid, then you, uh, and you're passing through the doors of the masjid, here is where you make the dua, Allahumma iftahli abu abu rahmatik. Allah, open for me a, the doors of your mercy. So just as you're passing through, through the doors uh, of the masjid, this is like passing into, uh, passing through the doors of Allah's mercy. When you enter uh, sometimes you might be able, if you keep your head up, you'll be able to, to, to catch a glimpse of, of the Kaaba. It's recommended to keep your head down and, and, and we'll be guiding you through all, all the crowds and, and where to go. Keep your head down until you're in the Mataf. The Mataf is the bottom floor where the Kaaba is. When you reach that area, then raise your head. Because then at that point, the first time that you put your eyes on, on the Kaaba, this is another place that Dua is accepted. So here, in a state of utter humility, is where you um, you want to you want to praise Allah and glorify Him, and uh, and then send send prayers on the Prophet وسلم, and then make whatever du'as you'd like to make. Tawaf itself, Tawaf is seven circuits, beginning at the Blackstone and ending at the Blackstone. One of the conditions of Tawaf as opposed to sa'i, is you have to be in a state of tahara, you have to be in a state of ritual purity, meaning you have to be in wudu. If you break your wudu doing, doing tawaf, you have to go out, make wudu, and come back in. If that happens after the fourth one, come see me, we'll talk about what to do, because there's some detailed rulings there. But in general, you need to be in a state of um, of, of wudu for the entirety of the tawaf. If you break your, your, your wudu after your tawaf and before you do your sa'i between uh, Safa and Marwa, that's all right. You don't need to be in a state of wudu for Safa and Marwa. When someone performs, or when men perform tawaf, for the first three circuits, for the first three cycles that, that you go about, you should be walking briskly and, like a, and, and this is described like a warrior. What does that mean? You should have your arms up, and you should be moving your shoulders a little bit. Now, the crowds will be so much that you can't actually move fast, so you're more like doing this in motion. But the idea is, this is a place where a, where, um, a Muslim shows his strength, where a Muslim shows his, um, his, fear, his fear, fearlessness, because Allah is with him. And so in the first three, men should be doing this sort of motion where they have their hands up and they're walking briskly and um, with some seriousness. And then they should bear their right shoulder. So normally your upper garment is going to cover both shoulders. But in this one, you take your, you take your garment and put it underneath. And therefore, your right shoulder will be exposed. And then after the three, you can cover it back up. It's recommended when you pass the black stone in each circuit to kiss it. It's impossible to literally kiss the black stone. If people will fight for hours to get into the black stone, you'll be pushing with all your force. Uh, it's, it's not a good um, situation over there. Um, and because you're in the house of Allah, 
where uh, sins are magnified and it's a place of great sanctity. To fight in that sort of a place is, is a deep sin and really looked down upon. So you really shouldn't um, try to kiss the black stone because this because it'll force you to um, get involved in the fighting and in the roughhousing. Instead, what you can do, another way of kissing the black stone is when you pass the black stone, you turn towards it, you put your hands to your shoulders and you face your palms uh, uh, towards it. You say, Allahu Akbar. This is equivalent to touching the black stone or kissing the black stone. And you don't have to get involved in the fighting. So you go about seven times um, in, in constant dhikr the entire time. There are specific du'as recommended for certain places, but it's important not to get too caught up in the words of the du'a. There are lots of recommended uh, du'as for different times and places. The one that's most authentic is رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنِيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَةِ حَسَنَا وَبَقِيْنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ O Allah grant us in this life good and in the next life good and protect us uh, from the torment of the fire. So that's the only one I would absolutely memorize and, and make sure that you say it between the Yemeni corner and the black stone. All the other du'as uh, will give you some books. It'll have several du'as listed there. Otherwise, just be in a state of dhikr, just be in a state of glorification. Whatever du'as you have memorized, this would be the time for them. After you complete the seven circuits, we'll, we'll all be going in a group, so you won't get lost. We'll all be doing it together. After you complete it, it's obligatory to read two rakahs. You don't have to do it behind Baqam Ibrahim, but it's the sunnah. Again, the, whether we'll be able to or not depends on the crowd and how much uh, space there is. But we'll try to find a space behind Maqam Ibrahim and pray two rakahs. Again, here the recommended uh, prayer is to do Surat al-Kafirun in the first rakah and Surat al-Akhlas in the second rakah. After that, face the Kaaba, stand up, face the Kaaba, uh, do a istighfar, seek forgiveness of Allah and make dua. And then drink some some, and then you finish your tawaf, and you're about to go into your say. Uh, was that all for tawaf? Okay. Um, before we get into menstrual periods, um, about tawaf, any questions? Okay. Okay. So we mentioned with tawaf, you have to be in a state of wudu. Now, for menstrual periods, this becomes a bit of an, an issue if your period is going to align. Um, with um, doing your tawaf or doing your umrah. A few rules about menstrual periods. You can enter in, into ihram when you're, uh, when you're on your menses, but you cannot enter any mashid, and therefore you cannot perform tawaf. What this means is you don't want to be caught in a scenario where you've entered into the state of, of, of ihram, and then your, your period begins and you can't enter the masjid. Because what that means is you have to stay in, in, in the state of ihram until your menses ends, which will be however long it is. So it's recommended before you leave to plan out exactly when, when it's going to be. If you need to take you know, period blockers or period delays or something, uh, then talk to a physician and they'll be able to help you out with, with what to do there. If it happens that you are on your period and, um, and you are in a state of ihram and you have to leave Mecca before the period is, is going to end, then you should perform Umrah while still in, in your period and there's a, ha there's a hefty penalty to be paid uh, with that. And so you just go ahead and, and pay the penalty afterwards. There's obviously no sin involved in doing it because you had no choice but uh, there still is a penalty associated. And then we'll move on to Sa'i. Sa'i is walking between Safa and Marwa. Allah says in the Quran, in Safa wal Marwata min sha'air Allah, wa man yu'adim sha'air Allah fi innaha min taqwa al -kulub. You'll actually see this written uh, when you enter into Safa, there's a dome on top. These are the ayahs that are they're written on the dome. They mean, Verily, Safa and Marwa are from the rituals of Allah. And whoever venerates Allah's rituals, this is from the piety of the heart. This is from the piety of, uh, of the heart. And so, you begin and end with purity. You begin and end with veneration of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
the say itself is just the walking between the two hills. When we say seven cycles, a cycle is going from Safa to Marwa as one, Marwa back to Safa as two, and so on and so forth. So you begin at Safa, you'll end at Marwa after seven, and then you'll need to walk and back. In the middle, there are two green columns, and nowadays they've added green lights uh, up top where we're walking. That area is where you need to, where men need to rush or hasten. And so you, you just walk a little, a little bit faster uh, than normal. Again, similar to a Ramal, which, which you mentioned, the, the warrior walk is meant to show the strength of the Muslim and that and there's a fearlessness that Muslims are commanded to have. At each hill, at Safa and Marwa, it's recommended that you stand and, and, and supplicate and make uh, dua and to, and, and to spend time there not be rushing through these rituals. And then lastly, the haircut. After you finish your, your say, then um, we'll go back and then there are barbers underneath the clock tower, which is probably where, uh, where we'll go. You have the option, men have the option to either shave their head entirely or to trim. A trim means you're going to remove one inch of hair from all sides of your head. If you have less than one inch, then you have to shave. It is highly recommended to, to, to shave in any case. It is highly recommended to shave in any case. The trimming is uh, allowed, though, if people want to do that. While in a haram, you can't cut your own hair. You can't cut your own hair, and you can't cut someone's el someone else's hair, which is why you have to have a barber do it, do it for you. Uh, as, as my dad explained, for women, what that means is either if you're going with your husband or, or someone, he'll have his hair cut, and then he'll cut your hair, and then you can start cutting other women's hair, and it just continues in a cycle from there. And after you've gotten your, your hair cut, then you've reached the end of your ihram. Your ihram state has ended, and all of the prohibitions that were placed upon you have been lifted. Um, any questions about sa'i or, yeah? Uh, they usually charge about 10 dinars or so. so yeah. 10, 10, yeah, 10, 10 reals, so it's not expensive. Um, so, uh, in terms of, do you have anything else? Uh, a little, little bit more. We'll yeah. finish another last time first. Okay. Any other questions about say or the haircuts or other requirements? Okay. Uh, the last thing, just just a short thing about visiting Medina and visiting the Prophet them. We know that when the Prophet them made his hijrah to, to, to Medina, uh, the place of Medina changed names from Taiba to Medina and change names to Medina al Munawwara specifically. Taiba means illness. Uh, when, uh, uh, there's, there's, uh, sorry, it changed the name from Yathrib, sorry, to, um, to Medina al Munawwara. Yathrib means, means illness or disease. And so the Prophet, the coming of the Prophet وسلم, was like the coming of a light or the coming of a healing. And while he's there, وسلم, the place is still a place of light and a place of healing. The, um, when you're in Mecca and Medina, you might be tempted to explore the Mashid, which is fine. But the secret of Mecca and Medina is, in Mecca, the secret is the Kaaba itself. And so ideally, what, what you'll be doing every day is going to the Kaaba, at the very least seeing it, if not doing uh, tawaf or around it. All the blessings of Mecca come from the Kaaba. Similarly, in Medina, all the blessings of Medina come from the grave of the Prophet Everything that happens in Medina is from the blessings of that one place. There is a consensus among scholars and jama' that the holiest physical substance in the world is not the Arsh, it's not the Kaaba, it's not the Black Stone. It's the soil touching the blessed body of the Prophet um, 
when we give salams to the Prophet ﷺ, you'll enter through this gate. This gate is known as Bab al-Salam, the door, the door of Salam. It's right at the front of the Mashhad uh, in, in Medina. So you'll, so you'll enter through here, or there might be some other entrance depending on what sort of uh, obstacles they've, um, the, the Saudi officials have placed. But, but more or less you'll, sorry, yeah, for, for men, for women, you'll enter from the other side. And you'll go through here. At the end uh, will be the graves of uh, Sayyidina Rasulullah uh, first, and then Sayyidina Abu Bakr, and then Sayyidina Umar Radullah An. When you greet them, you should greet them knowing that they can hear you. As it confirmed in the in the Quran in, in several places, including Wala Tasabana Ladina Kuti Lufi Sabidullahi Amwat, Bal Ahyaan and Rabbihim Yurusakun. Allah says, Do not think that those who are killed in the way in the way of Allah, and this includes the Prophet وسلم, do not think them dead. No, they are living, given provision with their Lord. It's also known that the um, that the Prophet وسلم, in a Sahih hadith said that he is shown in his grave uh, the actions of his Ummah every Friday. And if he finds uh, what he's shown pleasing, then he praises Allah. And, and if he uh, finds uh, what they have done displeasing, then he seeks forgiveness uh, for them. When you meet the Prophet وسلم, you're meeting him. This is important to understand. He, um, the idea of being living is the idea of someone who responds to stimuli. That's the biological definition. And then our, our, uh, our own scholars had a similar understanding. And Allah said about the Prophet uh, Mubina. Verily we have, we have opened for your sake a great opening. Verily we have opened for your sake a great opening. In other words, every opening is through the key of the Prophet If you ever, if there's anything that you feel like is locked in your life, you bring that to the Prophet وسلم, when, when you meet him. If there's anything that you feel like is difficult in your life, that's what you bring to the Prophet وسلم, when you meet him. Um, uh, Allah says in the Quran, "Walla anhum idhalamu anfusum jauka fastag for Allah, fastag for Allahum Rasul la wajd Allah tawab rahima." Allah says, "When they oppress themselves, had only they come to you." And sought Allah's uh, forgiveness, and had the Messenger وسلم, sought forgiveness for them, then they would have found uh, Allah Tawab al Rahima, relenting of their sin and merciful upon them. Notice what Allah is telling you that you go to the Prophet, وسلم, and in that blessed location, that's where you seek Allah's forgiveness. So, acceptance of dua, acceptance of forgiveness comes when you do it paired with and coupled with the Prophet وسلم, either physically in location or in heart or something like that. And so there's a, a great blessing in being uh, in, in Medina. Like, like we mentioned, um, the uh, sins in Medina are, are very weighty, just like sins in Mecca are, are, are very weighty. And they're especially weighty on the Prophet because he said, because Allah says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ Verily, there has come to you a messenger from amongst your, yourselves. Else, what distresses you is weighty upon him. حَرِيسٌ عَلَيْكُمْ He has, he's, he has earnest for you. بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ رَأُوفُ الرَّحِيمُ He is kind and merciful to the believers. And when you send salawat on the Prophet وسلم, what does it mean? You're, I, I send prayers on the Prophet وسلم, and send blessings on him. What does that mean? Prayers and blessings. Our scholars tell us salah comes from the idea of tasliya. Tasliya is to burn away. When you come to the Prophet وسلم, you're sending prayers on him in, in the sense of you're burning away everything that's contrary to him. You're burning away everything that's not from his sunnah. And you're saying, 
and you're sending peace upon him, peace meaning, meaning you are safe from us, you have peace, that we won't contravene your, your Sharia, Ya Rasulullah. And so every time you're sending salawat on the Prophet Wasallam, you're promising him to stay true to Allah's commandments and to his commandments. And that's why specifically in, in that place to do any sin is to offend the Prophet Wasallam himself and he is forced to ask forgiveness for you. Um, you know, uh, any last questions before we end? in terms of Mecca or Medina or the Umrah itself. The last thing I wanted to, to, to mention, books to prepare from. The first book, The Accepted Whispers, um, is by Maulana Ashraf Ali Thanwi. It has, it's a collection of pretty much all of the du'as in the Quran and the Sunnah. So I'd recommend everyone guess this. Um, uh, it, it'll, it'll be available on Amazon or, or, um, or anywhere like that. Amazon or, or or, or if, you're, if you're having trouble, we can find you copies. The second book, um, this is for people who want details about the fiqh of, of Hajj and Umrah. This is by Sheikh Nur al uh, who is a famous uh, Sheikh, uh, Shami Sheikh of the previous century. He collected this brief manual to talk about all the rulings related to Umrah and Hajj, as well as the du'as related. And then the last book, the Hajj and Umrah book, compiled by our own local Ustad Layla Fakira. Um, We'll be passing out uh, copies of those, and those are just du'as for specific locations in Hajj and Umrah. Rasulullah Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. It seems like they've started praying, so let's head over.